Chair Mayron, you can go ahead and start. We are live. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. I call to order the February 2021 meeting of the Governance Policy, Governance and Policy Committee. As usual, we have a very full agenda, so let's begin. The first item on our agenda is the resolution related to amendments to urgent approval authority. This is a item for action. You will recall that we postponed consideration of the resolution at our December meeting. Since then, changes were made to the resolution and a revised version is before us today for action. At this time, I would invite Regent Rocha to provide us with a summary and any comments he has before we move to discussion. Regent Rocha. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I won't be very long, uh, but this was, um, uh, you know, obviously we've had a couple of iterations here and working with the chair uh, has been very um, productive. Uh, and, and in taking into account some of the concerns that were raised at the last meeting, um, it's, it, you know, I think addresses the concerns that were raised and is, is pretty streamlined. Uh, first, I would point out that it um, it removes what was not intended to be restrictive language, but what was perceived as a restrictive language as to under the, circum the circumstances under which um, the administration through the president would, would seek uh, an urgent approval um, and just identifies that it's a, um, if it's in the, the opinion of the president that um, that waiting for the next regular meeting would, would uh, create a a health safety or, or mission risk. So it's, it's very broad language, which is, which is I think a good thing. Uh, it then uh, moves the, the determination to the, uh, the board chair. Um, one, of the, one of the significant changes uh, in this particular draft is that, and this came off of, of you know, Regent uh, Davenport had, had brought the, you know, the concern about um, in, in a dire emergency, would there be the capacity to, to make a decision uh, in, in the best interest of the university and the university community? And this actually um, provides that the chair alone will have the authority to act, uh, which makes sense because if, if the, under the previous uh, re, uh, pr provision, um, it required three people to participate. Well, if two, uh, one or two of the other folks aren't available, then you, it doesn't really get you uh, that, that sort of urgent approval capacity. Whereas this language not only um, you know, authorizes the chair to make that determination and under those circumstances, but certainly wouldn't prohibit the chair from consulting with the vice chair or committee chairs as well, um, if, if you know, time was indeed available. Um, so that's a significant uh, revision that I think uh, addresses concerns that have been raised by other members of the board. Um, uh, next, it, it uh, also adds a provision there was concern that if the chair, uh, the chair himself or herself was not available at the time, would that then leave the university frozen in, in the face of an emergency? And so this, this also provides that in the uh, uh, absence or unavailability of the chair that the vice chair would then step into that position to be able to make that determination in the best interest of health, safety and mission. And uh, from there, it's the chair and or the, or the vice chair in the chair's absence would then determine whether there is time uh, to contact all regents. Uh, and if, if all regents are contacted um, under the circumstances where a quorum is not available, it would then trigger that the ability for uh, the, the chair or vice chair in the chair's absence to make a determination uh, on behalf of the board in, that, in, in, the, in the face of, a, of an emergency. Um, and then finally, it, it just clarifies that the matter will be brought for, as, a, as a, an information item to the next regular meeting of the board um, in, in which case the, the board will determine whether any action is necessary, uh, as it says, uh, for action as appropriate. So, uh, Madam Chair, I think that covers the, the language itself, and I would certainly be happy to uh, respond to any questions uh, to the extent that I'm able to answer them. I think that the chair of this committee is, is um, perhaps better versed than I am in, in a lot of respects to, uh, to answer those questions. So uh, that concludes my comments. Thank you, Regent Rocha. Before we begin our discussion, is there a motion to recommend approval of the resolution related to amendments to urgent approval authority? I would move it. All right, second. we have the motion and we have a second. Thank you, any discussion? I'll give Sarah here an opportunity to see if there are any individuals who would like to participate. Uh, Chair Mayron, we've got Regent McMillan and Regent Swigum who would like to speak. Uh, all right, Regent McMillan. 
Thank you, uh, Chair Mayeron. Just a quick comment. Um, I'm very grateful to yourself, Regent Rosha, and others who engaged here with you directly, including our capable, but more than capable, um, Office of Border Regents uh, staff. So this is a good work product. I'm 100% supportive, and I appreciate the patience that everybody went through to get it to this point. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you, Regent McMillan. Regent Sviggum? Um, Mr. Chair, Madam Chairman, um, I guess I will just kind of echo what uh, uh, Regent McMillan has said. Uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, Darren, uh, Regent Rosha, for modifying the original language. Uh, the work that you did, Madam Chair, with uh, the language should be uh, thanked as well. Uh, it probably, the changes improved current policy with a little more accountability, a little bit more openness. Uh, but while I say that, I also want to make note and publicly make note that I don't believe that there was uh, in the past any misuse or any abuse of the urgent approval policy, either by uh, President Kaler or President Gable. Uh, I don't think there has been anything that triggered this change, but it still probably does improve the process with a little more openness and fully supportive. Thank you. Thank you, Regent Segum. Uh Any further comments? Ms. Dirksen, anybody else have their hand raised? I don't see any hands. All right, then I think we are ready uh, to proceed uh, to vote. Ms. Dirksen, if you could please call the roll on the motion to recommend approval of the resolution related to amendments to urgent approval authority. Great. On the motion, Regent Anderson. Yes. Regent Anderson votes yes. Regent Beeson. Yes. Regent Beeson votes yes. Regent Davenport? Yes. Regent Davenport votes yes. Regent Herr? Regent Herr? Yes. Regent Herr votes yes. Regent Shu? Yes. Regent Shu votes yes. Regent Kenyanya? Yes. Regent Kenyanya votes yes. Regent McMillan? Yes. Regent McMillan votes yes. Regent Powell? Yes. Regent Powell votes yes. Regent Rosha? Yes. Regent Rosha votes yes. Regent Simonson? Yes. Regent Simonson votes yes. Regent Swiggum? Yes. Regent Swiggum votes yes. Chair Mayron? Yes. Chair Mayron votes yes. Chair Mayron, there are 12 yes votes and zero no votes. Thank you. By a vote of 12 to zero, the motion is approved. Thank you very much. And thank you, Regent Rosha, for all the work that you did on this. And also let me uh, thank the general counsel's office who also uh, assisted and weighed in on, on the modifications as well. Much appreciated. All right, our next item on the agenda is uh, an action item on the proposed amendments to the Board of Regents policy, alcoholic beverages on campus. Here to provide us with an overview of changes to the amendments since we reviewed them at our December meeting is Vice President Kramer. Vice President Kramer, if you could please proceed. Good morning, Madam Chair and members, and thank you for this opportunity to update you on the proposed amendments that we brought forward for your consideration at the December Board of Regents meeting. What I'd like to do very quickly is provide an update on two substantive policy changes that we have made as well as a recap of the meetings we continue to have with groups who are both supportive and those who have concerns. First, with respect to the policy, in the December meeting, we spoke about our desire to not use the mascots in any sort of alcohol licensing. I understood a need to be more clear, more clear on that. And accordingly, the policy now reflects that we will prohibit any use of the five mascots in any alcohol licensing. The second policy change, the president had originally proposed that she would use, if you approve this policy amendment, some source of the revenue for student alcohol counseling. The president will continue to do so, but again, in the interest of greater clarity, that amount will now appear as a line item in the president's annual budget. With respect to groups, we met with the University of Minnesota Alumni Association, and on behalf of the president, Lisa Lewis, she asked me to convey their strong support for this policy amendment on behalf of over 500,000 legal age adults who are interested in furthering their association with the University of Minnesota across all our campuses. You also received a support letter from students in CFANS stating their support for this initiative, noting in particular the direct relationship that CFANS has 
in improving agricultural production, the raw material for so much alcohol manufacturing. I met with Boynton Health Services, representative of the UMD Chemical Health Advisory Committee, and others who have concerns about this policy. I know that they and others have communicated directly with you. I want to acknowledge that their concerns are not unfounded. Issues of underage drinking or overconsumption can have lasting physical and mental impacts. This is a societal issue, the one that's been addressed in part by states raising their legal drinking age, lowering the threshold for driving while intoxicated, and by the efforts of alcohol manufacturers to promote responsible drinking. Where I do disagree respectfully is that this activity that you're considering targets students directly. Using the Twin Cities as an example, our students today see both alcohol consumption and advertising in all three of our principal athletic venues. They see alcohol advertising if watching a gopher sporting event on television, and they see alcohol advertising if watching our teams, whether in on TV or in person, when our teams play in venues where the host team has already allowed alcohol advertising. If you approve this policy, any licensing would be in place only in those venues, bars and restaurants and liquor stores, where only adults of legal age can consume alcohol. Finally, I wanna address a concern I heard from our campuses regarding maximum flexibility and how best to use this category if you choose to approve it. I wanna reiterate that University Relations believes strongly this is not a central initiative and that indeed each campus should have the freedom to use all of our open categories for licensing and sponsorship in a way that they see most fitting their culture, their campus and their community. I completely agree with that approach. We remain committed to working out the details if you choose to move forward, are confident that our data shows that this category enhancement is very much in line with higher education across the nation, and I stand ready to answer any questions you may have. Madam Chair, thank you. Madam Chair, you're muted. Sorry, start over. Thank you, uh, Vice President Kramer, uh, for your summary. Before we start discussion, is there a motion to recommend adoption of the proposed amendments to the Board of Regents policy, alcoholic beverages on campus? I'll move it. Second. Is there a second? All right, thank you. To start our discussion, I would first like to call upon Rodrigo Tojo Garcia, our student representative to provide comments on behalf of the student representatives to the board. If you would like to proceed at this time, uh, Mr. Garcia, we would welcome your comments. Thank you, Chair Mayeron, and thank you, Vice President Kramer, for your presentation. I think the first thing that I would like to outline is that this proposal claims that it will only affect students who are already of legal drinking age. I take issue with that characterization, to say the least. On a university campus, the advertising that would come about as a result of this policy will undoubtedly end up having some effect on students who are below the legal drinking age. And it's true that this is a societal issue, as VP Kramer pointed out. However, this is an issue that is directly within the control of the University of Minnesota, and more specifically within the control of the Board of Regents. The WHO, among other public health institutions, has outlined that directing advertising for alcohol towards young people and especially students is harmful in the long run. And as we've seen time and time again over the past 10 months, adhering to basic evidence-based public health guidelines is the best way to prevent damage to our communities. As you've seen in the letter from the uh, MSA forum this week and also from the student representatives team, there is strong opposition to this in part because of the science behind it. But in addition, we also have concerns about the welcoming communities that we have tried to forge on all of our campuses. And we have severe reservations about the impact that this might have. After all, this policy could open the door to allowing alcohol um, advertising directly in university buildings meant for academic research or housing, two areas that I personally find it inappropriate to even consider uh, advertising alcohol directly to students, doubly so since university housing is home to a, a, a large number of students under the legal drinking age. Uh, so before I move forward, I would just ask of uh, VP Kramer, or uh, I don't, I think you're the only presenter today, so I hate to put you on the spot. Um, 
what sort of, uh, you mentioned that there was some data that you had access to that uh, perhaps illuminated um, ways in which the university could mitigate the impact of this change. Uh, and could you share a little bit more about that? Thank you. Vice President Kramer, do you want to respond to that question? Um, Madam Chair, thank you. Student Representative, um, the data that I said at the very end of the presentation is something I repeat, or I would repeat from our December presentation. 11 of the 14 Big Ten teams are, have already allowed alcohol licensing and, and uh, advertising, and over 50% of higher education institutions nationwide have already allowed this. I don't disagree on the societal impact. The issues of alcohol overconsumption and underage drinking remain in our nation. But at the same time, the University of Minnesota made the decision in 2014 to allow alcohol consumption in our athletic venues. Finally, I would point out the policy specifically excludes advertising in either dormitories or classrooms or research space. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Anything further, Mr. Garcia? No, thank you, Chair Mayor. All right, thank you for your comments. They are very much appreciated. At this time, any other comments uh, by any of our other colleagues? Ms. Dirksen, let me know if anybody's raised a hand. Chair May Ron, Regent Rosha. All right, Regent Rosha. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, this is, um, this is a, an interesting and, and, and kind of a, it's a challenging topic. Um, having seen a lot of different issues come before the board over a long time. Um, I understand the, the position uh, being advocated by um, Vice President Kramer, um, but I, I, I'm troubled by it overall. And, and, and Mr. Tojo Garcia raised some very good points, um, you know, irrespective of some of the, the, the you know, restrictions that may or may not be in place with respect to um, the dormitories and research space, it, to me, it really kind of comes down to the brand and protecting the brand of the university. Um, one of the challenges with this topic is it, it, it can be perceived, I think, by people outside of the university as being a uh, prohibitionist um, a, a approach uh, to, to be against it versus um, promoting, you know, increased consumption of alcohol if you support it. And I don't think either of those things are true. I think it becomes a function of uh, evaluating the pros and the cons, the benefits and, and the losses. Um, I will say at the outset that I was I was really surprised at how little revenue was in play. Um, there's not much involved money wise, um, and and so from that standpoint, and when you consider a four billion dollar uh, university um, on an annual basis, but but at the same time, I, I think it does have a pretty substantial um, impact on our brand and on what the university stands for. I, you know, short history lesson in, in you know, in the 80s, my, my sister, who was a, a year ahead of me in school, um, she's now 15 years younger than I am, but she was at that point a year ahead of me in school. And um, she, she came to the university when the drinking age was 19. And as a Gen Xer, I was the first year that was not grandfathered in and became 21. Uh, when the drinking age became 21. And, and, and that had a big impact on campus uh, because as a freshman, she and her friends were going to bars and, and restaurants that served alcohol. Um, whereas now, um, as, as it was when I was a, an undergrad, the majority of our students are not 21. The majority, you know, you, most people are not until they're sometime during their junior year as undergraduates. And so Mr. Tojo Garcia's uh, con concern about underage folks being impacted um, by the marketing, I think is, is, is not um, poorly placed. And so, you know, in that context, I it just, it, it, I, I'm, I'm not convinced that, that this, it, it makes sense for us and for our relationships. I'm, I'm not compelled by the majority of Big Ten schools or 50% of all schools, because um, by the same token, uh, that means that, you know, close to 50% perhaps are, are not doing it and, and, and their brands are not associated with, uh, with, with alcohol, the sale of alcohol. Um, I respect the, the CFAN's position, but uh, as Mr. Kramer just stated, uh, people will be consuming alcohol. It's just a matter of whether the university is attaching its name to it. Um, so I don't know that we diminish the, the agricultural value um, uh, by, by not proceeding with this. I would, I would say the arguments that I've heard today um, as I was listening would, um, would also apply to tobacco, would also apply to lottery. 
uh, would apply even to firearms. You know, people are going to buy firearms, so why wouldn't we take advantage of, of, of potential revenue by having University of Minnesota uh, endorsements of, of, of that? And, you know, these are concerns in our society. There's a federal agency, ATF, specifically to address these, these concerns. So, you know, sitting as a member of this board and, and, and having a fiduciary responsibility to promote the long-term success of the university and the reputation of the university, I just don't, I, I just don't think the case has been made for, for that, the amount of money that's potentially being raised. Um, and I'm not convinced that simply articulating that some percentage of our, our money would be uh, provided for dealing with substance abuse challenges, um, especially if we're at the same time contributing to the potential of, of, of those challenges being increased. It just doesn't seem like the right thing for our university to, to be doing at this moment in time. So Madam Chair, uh, with that long statement, I'm, I, I'm against this, uh, this, this proposal at this time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Dirksen, anyone else in queue? Chair Mayor on Regent Beeson. Thank you. Regent Beeson, you're on. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I, uh, I also was um, surprised with how low the revenue uh, estimates were off of the bids, but I would make the argument that that, that confirms um, uh, Mr. Kramer's comments that, you know, it's not going to have, because the money is so low, it tells me that it'll have very, very little impact on our brand and it'll have very little impact on the behavior uh, of students. So um, it's, it's almost, it, one could argue that it's, it's hardly worth even doing this because it is such a small amount of money. But on the other hand, the, the, the risk is very, very low that will create any, any um, uh, negative uh, consequences. So I do support it. Thank you, Regent Peason. Uh, any further comments, Ms. Dirksen? Uh, Regent Shu. All right, Regent Shu. And just so you know, uh, we have scheduled, um, I don't know if there's others in the queue I, so far, I think not, uh, but we'll, my hope is to complete this discussion and vote on the motion uh, by 8.30 so we can move on to our last topic uh, uh, with respect to our agenda today. All right, Regent Shu. Thank you, Chair Mayron. Um, I wanna thank uh, Vice President Kramer for um, making the change on the mascots. I was, I was concerned about that. Um, and uh, I think it's, it's better that if this does pass that um, we do not use our mascots in that type of advertising. Um, what, what I'm concerned about is the relationship between alcohol use and sexual assault. We've worked very hard to try and reduce that. I've, I've worked uh, hard beyond uh, my work at the university to understand and to try and solve uh, those types of problems. And I think that in this case, uh, I find the arguments um, from the students and from uh, some of our faculty and some of the letters that we received, I find those types of arguments fairly compelling. Um, so I will not be supporting this, um, but I think it will pass and I think it is a better re resolution uh, than the December version. Thank you. Thank you, Regent Shu. Ms. Dirksen, anyone else in the queue? Regent McMillan. All right, thank you, Regent McMillan. Thank you, Chair Mayeron, and uh, thank you, Vice President Kramer, for the work since the December meeting. I know that uh, I've heard personally from folks that uh, around the system that you reached out and uh, got considerably more input than what you had. Not all of it, of course, in support, as we've heard from our student representative and all of us have seen some uh, you know, material, thoughtful input in our uh, inboxes. I said last time I was you know, just this is this is a close call, and uh, I'm planning to support it. I'm not, uh, you know, wild-eyed about it, and I'm not wild-eyed in opposition of it. I think that if we 
it's different on each campus and uh, the relative amounts of money that can be made while may look small here may make a bigger deal at a place like Duluth as they struggle to find and put their their uh, budget into the black again coming out of this pandemic. So I think the fact that it can be individualized and treated in ways that, uh, you know, either used or not used as an option around the system is, is good. I think getting the mascot prohibition built in is also good. And I think that if we really want to reverse course and make a bigger difference in terms of student consumption of alcohol, we probably need to back all the way up to decisions long ago about selling alcohol in our venues. That uh, to me is, is a bigger deal than a branding opportunity that hopefully will be thoughtfully, carefully and wisely used and deployed in cases where they can actually make a bottom line difference. So I'm intending to support it and, uh, and thank you Vice President Kramer for the work you've done since December. Thank you, Regent McMillan. I see that Regent Kenyanya is in the queue. So Regent Kenyanya. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair, Vice President Kramer um, and everyone else who has spoken. Um, I, I certainly um, understand you know, both sides and I agree that reasonable minds can, you know, can differ on this. Um, so, you know, much like Region McMillan there. And, um, and I will, I, I will also say that th there are some good revisions here. Um, my concerns, well, I mean, in addition to some of the ones that have been said, um, you know, actually kind of arise out of the, the January 22nd memo that at least led me to believe, um, that even with the passage of this, there may be some hurdles, um, that the university is unsure of on whether or not, you know, we even realize that, that, that revenue that we're discussing, um, you know, whether we think it, it's big or small. Um, there were just some items in that memo that led me to believe that, okay, we pass it and we're still not even sure um, if it'll work. Um, so it, with that, in addition to some of the other things that have been uh, mentioned, um, I will not be supporting the resolution, but um Likewise, because I do anticipate its passage, I, I, I will um, call out that uh, the, the mascot revision um, is, is good to see, as well as the, the dedication of the specific portion of funds um, to, to the specific cause. And I, I think that the, when we talk about brand, the other, the, the, other, the other consideration is that, you know, the Block M affects every aspect and the university and, you know, every corner, whether it's the academic, athletics, all five campuses, extension and everything. And, you know, we'll be associating all those entities with alcohol, but the revenue won't be, won't be spread out that way. I mean, I, I imagine it'll probably mostly be on athletics or I'm, I'm really not sure. Um, and also won't be distributed um, system wide like that. But anyway, um, I, I appreciate the revisions and I do think this is a better resolution, but, um, mainly because of the, the memo that led me to believe that um, there are hurdles even past this resolution, I won't be supporting it. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Regent Kenyanya. Um, Vice President Kramer, do you want to address those hurdles or is there anything you want to comment on that? I don't think we have any other comments in the queue here, um, but you may have a, a, a comment about that particular item. Um, Madam Chair, members, thank you. I'd like to phone a friend, if I may. I believe we have an attorney from the Office of General Counsel on board uh, who's much better qualified than I am to talk about where this can be allowed and where there are hurdles with the state of Minnesota. All right. Let's see. Uh, I'm not sure from the General oh. Counsel's office. Well, who is that uh, General Counsel Peterson or who will be responding? Oh. I, I'm sorry, Madam Chair. Uh, attorney Piper, please. Ah, all right, that's why, Attorney Piper, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Mayron. Um, uh, so we shared a, a memo on January 22nd, as uh, Regent Kenyanya mentioned. Um, and we just wanted to point out that there are a few statutory um, hurdles and rules that uh, potentially 
could impact what could be done in this situation. I will say that um, the opinions uh, and, and the statute shared in that memo and, and our interpretation of them um, ultimately don't ultimately don't really matter. It's the uh, it's the opinion of the Commissioner of Public Safety and the Department of uh, Alcohol and Gambling Enforcement, um, in particular, whose opinions matter on those issues. Um, having said that, I think it's uh, correct that there would be hurdles um, to uh, to an alcohol company becoming maybe the the official beer of Gopher Athletics or uh, the University of Minnesota. Um, but there wouldn't be sort of categorical exclusions. Um, certain things would be allowed under those rules as they exist today, such as um, um, advertising, uh, maybe displays in liquor stores or um, in uh, bars or restaurants, other licensed premises. There's also an exception in the rule for um, an ad an advertisement does not include um, like packaging uh, or labels. So you could have uh, uh, like a, a Block M or official beer of Gopher Athletics on, uh, on uh, beer cans, that sort of thing. Um, but, but certainly other, uh, a, a broad campaign for um, official, uh, official beer of Gopher Athletics or something like that in multiple media platforms would not be something that I think would be permissible under the, the current rules. Um, so I think I think I'll leave it at that. And if you need more details, um, please please let me know. All right, thank you, Mr. Piper. I see that um, I believe as I looked at the scanning this that Regent Rocha has his hand up again. Regent Rocha, I'm going to ask that you uh, I will let you go ahead and speak again and bring us home. But if you could keep your remarks very short, I'd like to bring this to a vote so that we can get to the last item on the agenda. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate your indulgence and in, uh, a second opportunity. I just wanted to say uh, two things real quick. One is if if this does pass, and I, I prefer it wouldn't, but if it does, I would, I'm very interested in what the breakout ends up being between our marketing partners and the university as to who's receiving the revenue for uh, these, these types of endorsements um, or advertisements using our branding. Um, so I'll be especially interested in, in how that breaks out um, Vice President Kramer. And then the second thing I just wanted to say is I want to, I want to thank the students um, on this student leadership. We've gotten a lot of very, very thoughtful, very good feedback uh, from students. And, and my hope when, when receiving that was that that would sort of you know, end the matter or address the matter um, in, 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 in consistent with their position. Not only do I think they have, not only do I think that they've done a fantastic job of laying out the issues and the impact um, of, of this potential policy and, and the broader issue. But I, I felt that this, of, of the various issues that come before the board, this is so much about the culture that they currently um, want to see at their university. This is their time. And, and I felt that this would be one of those decisions where I would give a great deal of stock um, to uh, the, their position and, their, and their, their thoughtfulness on this. And so thank you to them. And, and I plan to uh, support their position. Thank you. All right. With that, uh, we will go ahead and take the vote on this. Uh, Ms. Dirksen, if you could call the roll. On the amendments to the alcoholic beverages on campus policy, Regent Anderson. No. Regent Anderson votes no. Regent Beeson. Yes. Regent Beeson votes yes. Regent Davenport. Yes. Regent Davenport votes yes. Regent Her. Yes. Regent Her votes yes. Regent Shu. No. Regent Shu votes no. Regent Kenyanya. No. Regent Kenyanya votes no. Regent McMillan. Yes. Regent McMillan votes yes. Regent Powell. Yes. Regent Powell votes yes. Regent Rosha. No. Regent Rosha votes no. Regent Simonson. No. Regent Simonson votes no. Regent Swigum. Yes. Regent Swigum votes yes. Chair Mayron. Yes. Chair Mayron votes yes. Madam Chair, there are seven yes votes and five no votes. Thank you. By a vote of seven to five, the motion is approved. Thank you for the excellent discussion and excellent work uh, by your office, uh, Vice President Kramer. Um, I think that your collaboration and gaining input from a variety of different constituencies uh, well served our discussion here today, much appreciated. 
All right, our final item in discussion uh, for discussion today is board assessment and options and objectives. This item was included in our work plan for the governance and policy committee and provides us with an opportunity to explore potential options and objectives for what an assessment like, might look like. Executive Director Steves has prepared a presentation to walk us through those options and then we will return for discussion. Mr. Steves, if you could proceed. All right, uh, Chair Mayron, I think we'll have, we're gonna be getting the slide deck pulled up here. And uh, I can just, uh, if we move to the next slide, I can just give you a quick overview of what we'll be doing today. Uh, we'll cover why boards conduct assessments, uh, some of the methods that, that boards use to conduct these assessments, some considerations that are uh, particular to public governing boards, and, uh, and a few of the hurdles that uh, boards need to overcome uh, when, they, when they engage in this space. Uh, and so we'll talk through those and I'll try to sprinkle in some examples uh, from uh, the Board of Regents throughout the, the conversation, just so you get a flavor for the kinds of, uh, the kinds of assessments and um, activities that can be assessment adjacent, I, I would say. So let's go to the next slide. So broadly speaking, boards assess, uh, assess to evaluate two broad categories of, of, uh, of work. One is around process objectives. So they might, uh, they might gear their assessment or target their assessment toward evaluating uh, leadership structure, committee structure, uh, meeting pro process, or uh, fiduciary oversight. Um, policy practices might be another area that boards concentrate on. Uh, all of these would be things that uh, would be uh, squarely in the space of, of board assessment and uh, evaluation to determine effectiveness of, of processes that a governing board engages in. Uh, likewise, uh, boards also uh, may engage in evaluating some of their, their people objectives, so to speak, uh, and that might be the, the strength of relationships am among members of the board uh, or with the administration or key stakeholder uh, groups. Uh, it could also be the, the health of the culture uh, on, on a board or a governing board. Uh, and so uh, it's important, I think, on the front end to have some clarity around what kinds of things you're hoping to assess so that you can design an assessment such that it will actually accomplish that. If you have an assessment, for instance, that's entirely focused on, on structure and, and processes of policy, but what you really are hoping to get out of it is something related to the health of relationships uh, on the board, um, you'll, you'll have a misalignment that won't yield the, the kinds of outcomes that you're hoping for, the kinds of information you're hoping for. Uh, and interestingly, this board has actually engaged in, in both of these um, in the past. Uh, in 2014, uh, as an example, the, um, the Board of Regents actually did do a, a formalized structured survey that uh, was then subsequently used in a board conversation. It was largely focused on the process objectives. So things like meeting effectiveness and uh, processes around agenda setting and, and other, uh, you know, other um, process type uh, activities. And likewise, in, in 2015, the board uh, engaged in a, in a facilitated conversation with an outside consultant where uh, that consultant did one-on-one -on -one interviews with, uh, with regents. And it, the, the focus really was uh, around relationships and relationship building. Uh, in that space. So this board does have a history of doing those kinds of things. And I'm going to talk a little bit more as we go on about other activities that the board has engaged in that, uh, like I say, are either assessment or assessment adjacent type activities. Let's go on to our next slide. So uh, well-designed assessments really help provide a snapshot of how well the, a, a governing board is functioning. It provides a common understanding and language that will allow the group to, to have conversations that maybe sometimes are, are difficult or awkward. Uh, it can focus, uh, the, the, focus the conversation on actual performance as compared to agreed upon uh, processes or standards, and then help identify gaps. But 
uh, there are also some reasons why boards shouldn't conduct assessments. So those are all the good things that come out, can come out of assessments, but there are some things that, that uh, if used improperly, assessments can actually have a detrimental impact. And that is, uh, if you're trying to use an assessment to address problems between individual board members, or uh, it's being used to try and place blame for uh, an outcome that, uh, that maybe uh, uh, certain members didn't like, or um, as some kind of a quick fix uh, to try and transform uh, a board in some way in a, in a rapid manner. Uh, though assessments don't tend to be helpful in that space and like I say can actually be uh, more harmful than good because in some cases they can be viewed as a as kind of a, a weapon or something like that where instead of enhancing and building relationships and building common understanding they're actually um, they, they actually are viewed as the opposite and so those things are are just important to keep in mind that they have uh, they have lots of of benefits and they also can have some drawbacks depending on how they're designed, depending on the motivations behind them. Let's go to the next slide. So there are a variety of assessment methods, uh, and I'm going to touch on three major types. Uh, the first is a self-assessment, and that is largely feedback uh, or feedback solely from members of the governing body. Um, and so that 2014 and, and 2015 effort that I talked about was in this space. It was uh, solely feedback from members of the board about the board and its performance. Um, another type is uh, a 360 degree assessment where not only the um, input is gathered from members of the governing board, but also from other key stakeholders. Uh, it could be the administration or uh, uh, faculty in shared governance or you know, the president or, or other entities that you, could, uh, that you could imagine that might have some thoughts or opinion on the, the work and, um, and outcomes being produced by, by the governing board. And then finally, uh, a third type of assessment might be a document or process evaluation, uh, comparing, comparing the um, core governing documents and procedures of a governing body to some standard of best practice or some model of uh, another institution that um, is viewed as, as having a particularly good process in that area. Um, all three of these assessment methods can be done with a consultant, or, or without, um, and and so there, it's the the whether or not you engage someone else to help you with this is really um, is really a decision that you need to make. Kind of once you once you decide what it is you want to do with the assessment, what what objectives you have, and then you decide your method. Then you can decide how you'll actually proceed to do it. Whether you want to handle it in house or whether you want to hire a consultant and uh, have that person. Um, guide you through that process. Okay, let's move to the next slide. Um, public boards tend uh, to use a formal assessments much less than their private peers, both private higher ed boards as well as uh, you know private nonprofit boards or or even private uh, private sector boards. Um, and there, are, uh, in fact, when we when we talked with our um, our membership association, the Association of Governing Boards, uh, they report that only about one third of public university, college and university boards across the country do some sort of formalized assessment on a regular basis. So two thirds are, are not. Uh, and that, that holds up also in the Big Ten, uh, that, that percentage is, a, is roughly the same. Um, noting that uh, the Big Ten, even though all, you know, except for Northwestern, even though all are public boards, they all have different um, levels of permissiveness in terms of their ability to, um, to, to meet in closed sessions or, or have uh, conversations that are, that are perhaps more free-flowing. All right, let's go to the next slide. Um, and as I alluded to, uh, the reason that public boards or you know, perhaps some of the reasons that public boards use assessments less than private, uh, private peers are, um, are, are, are several. Uh, one of those is, uh, is sunshine laws. Uh, sometimes things like uh, open meeting laws or uh, data practices uh, act or, you know, similar records laws 
make it um, make it challenging for board members to feel like they can be truly candid in uh, providing assessment feedback, um, either on processes that they don't find to be um, as you know as effective as they would hope, or or you know perhaps issues with other members or the health of the relationship among members of the board, and so because of that um, because of that kind of uh, tension between uh, between the, those those laws which you know ensure transparency and uh, people's willingness to be candid sometimes I think public boards tend to shy away a bit from from formalized assessments uh, secondly uh, public boards tend to not be self perpetuating uh, in that they don't control their own membership and one of the big areas that private boards use assessments to evaluate is um, are gaps on their board um, gaps in skill set or um, they, they evaluate the effectiveness of the group as a team because then they can go out and recruit people to fill, fill gaps. Um, public boards don't have that same, uh, that same structure. And so public boards tend to um, either be appointed by or elected by uh, uh, the governor or legislature or members of the public. And so the board doesn't have, uh, doesn't have control over its membership in the same way. And so some of the motivation to uh, do those assessments is, is reduced or diminished. And finally, timing. Uh, boards in particular in the public sector, more so than, in the, than private boards, uh, are ever-changing. Um, you know, this board, for instance, every two years is reconstituted, at least to some extent. And uh, that, that ever-changing nature of public boards means that the timing of assessment can be challenging. Do you, do you assess just after an election when you have new members who haven't yet experienced some of the, you know, the, either the culture or the, the processes of the board? Or do you wait until near the end of their term when they have lots of experience, but now you're just on the cusp of having new members again? And so it's always a little bit awkward to try and figure out what the timing might be. But um, this board has actually uh, overcome a number of these hurdles. And, and I would argue, um, and I, I wanted to just give a few examples. Um, I would argue that in many ways has, um, has developed uh, a culture of ongoing assessment. Um, in 2015 and 16, this, this board created a special committee on governance and policy that uh, was the precursor to this committee actually right now. And this committee was then created in 2016-17. Uh, this, this provided a forum for these kinds of conversations, other kinds of conversations. You may recall that we had a, an expert from AGB join this committee at one point and talk about uh, governance best practices. Uh, this, this has also led to regular and ongoing conversations around uh, processes and annual planning and fiduciary responsibilities and similar topics. Uh, this, this committee has taken up comprehensive reviews of reservation and delegation of authority, which the, the policy related to reservation and delegation of authority, which is a fundamental um, governance kind of process uh, document that, uh, that actually drives a lot of the work that the board uh, engages in. Similarly, the, the board operations and agenda guidelines policy, which um, resulted in a, a pretty significant restructuring of committees and, uh, and many updates to both agenda processes and um, other procedures on the board. And likewise, the board engaged over a, over a the, a two-year period from 2018 to 2020 um, in a, a, a really comprehensive set of discussions around uh, the board's code of conduct for its own members. And so th there were many conversations around um, uh, expectations of one another, fiduciary responsibilities, and, uh, and, and conversations in that similar vein. And, uh, and then I would just also note that both um, both on a staff level and uh, among members of the board, we have been for many years very active in the Association of Governing Boards and among our Big Ten peers. And that has given us uh, a tremendous opportunity to gather uh, best practices information and bring back a lot of a lot of information that has been really helpful and useful in designing um, in designing our processes and procedures. So I, I guess I would I would 
uh, offer that simply so that you have some context around um, around ways that this board has um, has actually tried to uh, uh, accomplish some of the work that assessments um, aim to provide, or some of the outcomes assessment aim, assessments aim to provide, um, even even though it has uh, probably gone. Um, it has probably gone more away from having a formalized, uh, routinized, regular annual assessment process. So with that, we'll turn to a few discussion questions because the whole point of this was to give you some context and then, uh, and then allow members of the board to really engage in some discussion around, uh, do you see the uh, assessment as, a, as potentially adding genuine value to the work of the board? Um, do you wish to engage in a more formalized assessment process? And if so, uh, what objectives might you have? Uh, what approach might you want to use? What time frame makes sense given that, uh, that awkwardness of you know, every two years election? Uh, so those are just some discussion questions. I think all would be valuable uh, because they can allow this group to decide um, how it wishes to engage in this space. And, uh, and that's really valuable to us as we, as we work to plan the board's work. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Steves, uh, much appreciated. Let's keep those questions up on the screen that you have. And why don't we open it for discussion? Uh, so let me ask Ms. Dirksen, do we have any, any regents in the queue to talk about this? Regent Powell. All right, let's start with Regent Powell. Well, thank you. Um, thank you, Chair Mayron. Um, and, uh, and Mr. Steves, you know, first of all, um, I do want to thank um, uh, Chair Mayron, you know, and others, you know, on the board for kind of pursuing um, assessment, you know, in an effort to, um, uh, and as a way to help us improve our performance as a board. Um, I really, uh, I really appreciate the, this work. And I also uh, want to thank Mr. Steves for his presentation, which I thought was really an excellent overview of this topic and I, I think hit the key points. So, and I just want to, uh, I just want to make a couple of, a couple of, of, uh, of um, kind of comments from my experience. And, and the first one is, you know, even in, even in private boards and, and corporate boards, you know, assessment can give rise to, uh, you know, quite frankly, very mixed feelings uh, among board members. I think, uh, you know, board members worry about confidentiality. You worry, you wonder, you know, will my comments be leaked? How will they be used? And so I think there's, you know, there's just a, you know, there's always questions about how, how candid can I, can I really be? You know, will the discussion end up being in some, in some way weaponized? And so um, there are, you know, there are challenges, uh, you know, with these kinds of things, uh, even, uh, in, in, in private board. And I, 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 do, th I do think that uh, Mr. Steve's uh, caution uh, uh, around, uh, you know, our open meeting laws and uh, the requirements that we have would be very problematic uh, for certain kinds of, uh, of assessment, uh, you know, with all of us knowing that, you know, anything that we say, uh, you know, really uh, will be, uh, be uh, could become uh, public. Um, having said that, um, I, I think that there are there are ways that we could um, very productively engage as a board, you know, to work on our own performance. And my, uh, you know, I get my thought is that open full board discussions of our performance led by an expert uh, in governance who's very familiar with the kinds of challenges that come up on university boards uh, and, and public boards and, 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 you know, really an expert on best practice that conversation led by an expert in the open with the full board, you know, on topics of our choice, whether they be structure, process, uh, or other, that could be very, 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 very productive. And I, I, I think I recall a year ago, we had an expert come in uh, uh, at one of our retreats, and the feedback on that uh, brief uh, 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 meeting, I believe, was quite positive. And so I do think there are ways that we could engage uh, to, uh, you know, to improve our performance, and that might be one way. So thank you, Madam Chair. All right, thank you very much for those comments. Other individuals who would like to speak? I believe uh, Regent Anderson is next. And then, uh, and then, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, who else do you have in the queue then? Sure. Uh, it's Anderson, Regent Shu, Regent Davenport, Regent McMillan, and then Regent Rosha. 
Okay, got it. All right, Regent Anderson. Thank you, I just had to unmute. Um, I, I find nothing, nothing wrong with this and um, Director Steves gives some, some good ideas on what you can do. However, I sometimes think that when you put it all in a funnel and you phase it down through the funnel, put it through, you sometimes come out with this discussion on a group think type deal, like this is what we need to do. This is how our processes have to work. And, and uh, Director Steves actually made a comment, a quote, he said something like, somewhere in there are the objectives you want. Well, I'm, I'm really concerned and, and notwithstanding Chair Powell's comments, and he did mention this once in a while or a little bit in there, that sometimes board members are not always uh, on board with these because they're wondering if they're getting put into a funnel and getting to a predetermined result. I think diversity of opinions are really, really important to this board. I think we're very well served with differing backgrounds, differing opinions, differing thoughts. And I would suggest that, not suggesting that Director Steves is doing this, but sometimes it can lead to it that there are other objectives for sometime assessing a board. And I would just be careful how we do that to try to place them into a group think type of, of uh, environment. That's just my comment. Thank you. Thank you, Regent Anderson. Regent Chu. Uh, thank you, Chair Mehron. Uh, this is a very interesting topic. Um, I um, commend you for keeping this on the uh, agenda, even though it's been bumped numerous times. I think the presentation by uh, Director Steves was excellent. Um, it did review some of the things that uh, we've done uh, since I've been on the board. So I've, I've seen uh, most of this happen. Um, I do uh, ask, uh, is Mr. Steve still there? I assume he is. Um, if Mr. Steve's could maybe go through a little bit more of the history, um, I believe that um, the last time we talked about doing a survey, we backed away from it because uh, we thought we thought that the survey would uh, become public information, and I think people didn't want that to happen. So because we are a public board and we do have um, uh, Sunshine Laws and Data Practices Act uh, uh, type things that we have to live by, um, what is Director Steve's uh, opinion on, you know, that type of work? I understand a survey was done. He didn't go back far enough in the history but I do believe uh, a survey was done in 2014. Is that correct? Executive Director Steve, do you want to address that quickly and that so we can make sure that we get comments from others as well? Uh, Chair Mayron, Regent Shu, yes, it, the, the, board, uh, the board engaged in a formalized survey in 2014. It engaged in a one-on-one -on -one set of uh, discussions and follow-up discussion in 2015. Um, and it discussed uh, whether to do an assessment in the summer of 2017, but, but did not uh, decide to proceed at that point in time. But again, I guess I, I would emphasize that um, whether or not the board engages in a formalized assessment in terms of a, a formal survey with results and discussion, uh, there are just a number of activities that, uh, that the board could engage in that are assessment adjacent and, um, and yield some of the, the same benefits. And that's where I was highlighting some of those other activities because I just think they're, they're, they've been quite valuable to this board and should be viewed in that same space, I think. All right, uh, Regent Chu, any follow-up before we move on? No, no, thank you. All right, thank you very much for that additional information. Uh, the next uh, Regent is Regent Davenport. Thank you, Chair Mayron and Mr. Steves. That was a good presentation. Three points I'd like to make. One, I believe that it is important to have some kind of periodic assessment, um, uh, maybe focus more on um, process objectives and um, board makeup skill sets, that kind of thing that you mentioned, Mr. Steves. Second, I believe there should be an element of external feedback. And uh, third, if we were to do this, 
um, very careful consideration of a facilitator. Um, there's a range of scales there too. So thank you. Thank you for those comments, Regent Davenport. Regent McMillan. I'll pass in the interest of time. Regent uh, Powell covered my thoughts largely. Oh, all right. I think Regent Rocha is next. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yeah, very, very good comments across the board here. And and I, you know, sort of to put a point on the, the concern that um, sometimes you, you know, in assessing your culture, you can create a culture of assessing culture. Um, and, you know, with the board of our variety, we, you know, we kind of fall in between other sort of governmental bodies and, and then yet corporate boards uh, with the number of times that we meet and so on that um, you, there, there's going to be a wide range of opinions as to what the role or what the operational effect of, of, our, of our board might be. And that's the big concern with this type of assessment is that, you know, it, some, some folks may perceive it as a tool to try to shoehorn um perspectives uh, onto the board as to how the board should operate as opposed to a, a natural assessment of, um, of how the board operates. That being said, I think that there's a, a tremendous value in having the conversation even among uh, board members um, ourselves. Uh, I think that um, having it in a regular and periodic uh, uh, approach um, really helps avoid the, the, the perception that somebody's trying to Re, you know, um, have an effect, a specific effect, or reach a specific outcome in the assessment uh, if it comes out at a certain time, particularly if it's during a, a period of, of considerable discussion. Um, you know, we're, our, our board is, is um, in a very interesting time. Uh, I think that you're seeing this across the nation um, where boards are really having to, to answer some difficult questions about not just the role of public boards, but also the role of public institutions like the University of Minnesota. And so being able to assess it um, in, in, and again, you know, Regent Paul, I think made some very, very good points on this um, in, uh, that being able to make that assessment in a way that provides positive, a positive um, opportunity to, uh, for improvement uh, in, in, that, in that dialogue, I think is great, uh, but just being very, very sensitive and very careful about the fact that it can be perceived by some folks as being something that's, you know, you know a, a political enterprise in itself. And so, um, but, but to that end, I think that our board office has been fantastic. And, and when we've done this in the past, I've, I've, I've taken a lot of very positive um, input out of it. So um, I appreciate the chair putting it on the agenda and look forward to the continuing dialogue. Thank you. Thank you, Regent Rocha. Ms. Dirksen, any other individuals with their hands up? No, Chair Mayor, there are none. All right, let me just share a couple uh, thoughts or comments that I, that I have. I've always been a big um, supporter of the use of board assessments uh, with the hope. And I think the, the objective, when we talk about what's the objective of any kind of board assessment, regardless whether what process you use, self-assessment 360, uh, whether you use an outside consultant or do it inside, is to evaluate your performance with the hope of improving your performance so that the board can become as effective as it possibly can in in what its mission and what it's called upon to do. I think that um, that uh, your comments, Mr. Steves, and also uh, by Chair Powell, uh, that the, the board has certainly taken actions from my viewpoint on uh, examining process uh, to improve its performance. And, and Executive Director Steves laid out a lot of different ways that we, through our governance, uh, this committee, through the examination of policies, what we're really doing is examining on a periodic basis the process that we use um, and perhaps continuing to do uh, that type of work it, as we've done it in the past, which is to periodically look at our uh, policies that govern us um, is maybe sufficient. I'm not sure, but that could be. I don't think what our uh, process right now does is looks at the people objectives that Executive Director Steves laid out um, in terms of strengths of relationships and the health of the board culture. He identified those as some objectives. And I, I'm not sure that anything that, at least since I've been on the board the last two years, really addresses that issue. And that comes down to, can we uh, address that kind of issue when um, 
when we are a public institution and we are subject to Sunshine Laws and Data Privacy Act, and, and uh, if we're going to look at those and address those objectives with the hope of always improving our performance, then the question is, we have to make sure people feel comfortable to provide feedback in whatever fashion they do it um, and to address their issues of concern of confidentiality. I, I think for me, before like I could come to a conclusion about whether to do an assessment, uh, whether to hire an outsider or not. I think it would be helpful as I think about it to get some more information from those public institutions who have conducted self-assessments, specifically focusing on them with the, on the assumption that they too are subject to uh, per, uh, sunshine laws or data privacy uh, laws, those sorts of issues, to find out how they uh, address them but more importantly, to find out the kinds of questions that they asked as part of those assessments, and then to find out whether ultimately, how did those boards who did the assessment, how, uh, what kind of, uh, to get feedback from them, did they find the assessment helpful? Um, and if so, what changes resulted as, as a consequence of doing that sort of assessment? So I think for me, getting some more information from our colleagues who are similarly situated to ourselves in the public sector, I think would be helpful to see whether uh, doing any sort of self-assessment, particularly one that focuses on the people objectives, whether that's feasible and ultimately, in my view, in terms of objective, improved the performance of the board. If, if we could find a way to do that, I would be all in favor of doing a board assessment, whether and Personally, I would be using an outsider, a facilitator as well um, to do that because the issues are, we need that expertise uh, and there are some excellent facilitators out there. But I, for me, I think I need a little bit more information about how useful this would be. Regent Mayra. So any further comments uh, by any of my colleagues before we bring this part of our agenda to a close? Regent McMillan has his hand up. All right, Regent McMillan. I, I couldn't stand the thought of actually passing, so I got to uh, no, question: Have we, have we? Your comments led me to pick up on a theme. There's, there's three exceptions to the disclosure laws. One is, of course, real estate. One is privileged and confidential materials, attorney-client privilege, and then the last is personnel data. And I know there's a for public officials, it, it's different and it may not work, but have we explored, and I don't want to ask the general counsel's office right now, but as you do that look at other other public boards, is there any way that a, that a basic assessment could fit under that personnel information or performance, you know, because a performance review of a university employee is not disclosing, it can't be disclosed. There's, there's areas there, maybe a little bit of work with the general counsel's office might bear fruit in that regard. I'm not trying to hide anything. I just think sensitive issues like this don't necessarily need to be, you know, I don't see a public purpose in that being disclosed. And there is that category for personnel issues. So maybe the the OB, the office of, board, of our, our board office could take a look at that and explore that with uh, Doug Peterson. Okay, thank you. Maybe it's not possible. Um, but... uh, Mr. Steves, hey, uh, maybe you wanna, if you, you, the board office may have already addressed that issue as to whether uh, it would fall under the exceptions on the Sunshine Laws or with respect to data privacy. And if not, we can certainly take a look at that as we uh, come back with uh, and evaluate all of the feedback that we've gotten here today. Mr. Steves? Chair, Chair, Chair oh, Mayor. There you are. Um, Chair Mayron, uh, we have actually explored that with the general counsel's office and uh, and I think largely concluded that it it does not um, it does not provide a, a, an avenue through which um, assessments could be uh, would would be classified in as private personnel data. Um, that said, I mean, we'll leave it to the general counsel's office to advise the board directly on that topic as we gather more information and then you can you can read their advice directly. All right, thank you very much. Anyone else have any other comments, Ms. Dirksen? No, Chair Mayron. 
All right. Well, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Steves, for an excellent uh, presentation. And I also know I want to thank Ms. Dirksen, who did a, uh, a lot of the yeoman's work on, on uh, the background of what makes for uh, an effective assessment, the, the, the pros and cons of it, all the work that Mr. Steves talked about. So I want to thank her as well. Uh, unless we have any other matters that the uh, regents wish to raise at this time, um, then I would indicate that we stand adjourned. And if I may just uh, interject. Yes. Um, uh, we'll, we'll reconvene at uh, 930 Central, a little over 15 minutes from now. All right. Thank you very much, Chair Powell. Uh, Chair Powell, we stand adjourned.